We're back on our program, Jones and Company, and of course we're talking with Chairman of the Progressive Liberal Party and Member of Parliament for Fox Hill, the Honorable Fred Mitchell. Let me not forget Cabinet Minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> uh, but, you know, another thing, an interesting thing, Mr. Mitchell, is anytime I see an issue, you know, in the world in terms of uh, the ongoing conflicts between the United States and China, uh, the war in, in Ukraine, and now the war in Israel. Uh, you know, I always think of questions to ask when I have the opportunity to interview you. And I know you came here uh, today to talk about the domestic situation. Uh, but what do you make of all of the turmoil we see uh, around the world? Uh, I, you know, I, again, I'm sort of philosophical with this stuff. This is, these are ancient feuds. And there's not really a lot you can do except to manage them. Mm -hmm. And uh, each side believes that they have a cause. Um, <clears throat> in terms of Ukraine, we are firmly on the side of the West with this. Uh, what uh, the Russians have done um, is not, in our view, acceptable. So that's our official policy on that. Uh, in terms of the Middle East, um, we've uh, not made any public statements ourselves. We exist within the CARICOM context, calling for the cessation of hostilities right. um, and uh, to allow humanitarian corridors, that sort of stuff, and the two-state solution, which is to allow the Palestinians to have their own uh, state established. Right. So, um, not sure um, that any of this can be beyond management, and sometimes it looks like you just have to wait until it peters itself out. What is more concerning for us, though, is that our close ally, Guyana, who's in CARICOM, now faces what appears to be a threat from a friendly country of ours, which is Venezuela. Right. Our own prime minister has been involved in trying to get the two sides to meet together to kind of diffuse what's going on there. But of course, it's a fight over resources. Right. Uh, Guyana has now hit the pay payload of um, oil. I think the last hit was something like 11 billion barrels of oil. The Venezuelans are contesting their right to the uh, to that area. Right. So there's some pretty tough language coming. Um, and uh, my guess is uh, the Venezuelans say they don't want a war, but my guess is there's a flashpoint uh, which is possible there, which we have to guard against because we wouldn't want that to happen. Right. Uh, President Maduro had uh, refused uh, to have discussions brokered by the United States of America to find some sort of compromise uh, to that issue. Do you think that that was an unfortunate moment, a moment where uh, perhaps there could have been some sort of middle ground found? Or do you understand his possible reasons or convictions for not, not wanting that? Well, there's an antipathy between the United States and Venezuela. Yeah. And... Uh, the Venezuelans believe the U.S. has interfered in their internal affairs. So the U.S. can't be um, an honest broker in that situation. What is more compelling, though, I think at this point, is the fact that as a result of what's going on between Russia and Ukraine, there's a problem with oil. And it's choking off the life, or threatening to choke off the lifeblood of the economy. Now, Venezuela has huge oil reserves. As a result, largely of Western sanctions, uh, Venezuela has not been able to invest in the oil fields to keep up with the technology and the machinery and not even sell the, the oil on the markets. Well, because of the situation, the U.S. is suddenly changing its view with regard to Venezuela. So that situation seems to be easing. Uh, so that's what makes... Maduro, I think there's a, elections are due next year. That's what makes Maduro's position kind of um, well, solidly against any attempt at the U.S. being um, a, an honest broker in the situation. Right. With the high deposits of, of oil that there are that there is uh, in Venezuela, and you know the whole petro Caribe scheme not being unavailable. Uh, to us because of Western sanctions, forcing us to go uh, on the international market and pay higher prices for oil. Do you, do you foresee uh, at any time where we might be able to uh, carry on trade of crude oil with Venezuela? 
No, no, there's no question. I mean, they're, they're loosening, the, loosening the sanctions now because, um, as I say, Russia and uh, Ukraine are at war. Right. So, um, the, and there's a demand for oil. Uh, it's not only for oil for fuel, but also uh, the um, fertilizer. So that's presented a difficulty. And then, of course, you have the war going on uh, between Israel and the Palestinians. So life is getting a bit difficult. So where are you going to find the fuel to keep the economy going? Clearly, Venezuela is the place. So what you find is uh, people's interests shift. Uh, if tomorrow, um, I think they found oil in Cuba, you'd find, you know, Cuba would be the greatest since the sliced bread. You wouldn't find any sanctions at all disappear. Right. Um, that's just how America goes. It's the economy and what controls the economy. Right. Uh, they've discovered, as I understand it, or I'm advised, that China, for example, where you have all this rhetoric about China is this and China is the next thing. But again, the U.S. president and the Chinese president just met. And essentially, it looks like they've just agreed. Look, we have to get, get along. And they, you know, you can't de it's not easy to decouple these things as easy as you would, uh, you would think. It's just not possible. So everybody has to find a mechanism for getting along. Uh, and indeed in their own space. Right. Before we do move to, to talking a little bit about China, though, would, would the Bahamian government then, in terms of Venezuela and oil, would the Bahamian government and you as foreign minister, would you say, hypothetically, support an application by a Bahamian to the United States Office for Foreign Asset Control for an exemption uh, from the sanctions uh, on Venezuelan oil? Well, I'm not sure us as a government interfering in the sanctions policy uh, would make any sense for us. And here's why. For the same reasons we were not part of Petro Caribe and those arrangements. Um, we are not in the business of oil purchasing. The government doesn't do that. Yeah. Uh, the private sector in the Bahamas buys oil yeah. and there's no issue with oil supply. Um, the, the quarrels about the price but no issues about supply. Right. So there's no foreign policy reason, in my view, for us to be involved in it at all. Right. And you know, I'm a great believer in what doesn't involve us. Uh, we just stay out of it. Right. On to the, the, the issue with China. And you spoke to, and I believe there was President Xi in um, San Francisco right. uh, last week. But do you believe that there's a conflict that exists between the United States and China? Um, I, I, I don't think there is a conflict in the sense of a hot conflict, but obviously these are two competitors right. for the economic space in the world and also for the political hegemony. The United States, uh, we've been living in the era of the Pax Americana since the Second World War. Right. Um, China has now become the second largest economy in the world and <clears throat> is challenging U.S. domination. Um, I think there's a space, a space enough for everybody. So I don't think, uh, you know, I think there will be rational actors on both sides to make sure that this moves forward. <laughs> what uh, would be concerning to us, of course, is that uh, is both countries uh, at various points, uh, it looks as if we're in the middle. And it does. Uh, that uh, sometimes we're being asked to choose. Um, even while what is being recited is, you're an independent country, you can only make your decisions. And that's true, but <clears throat> the Chinese are very frank. They understand that we are 50 miles away from the states, and this is not a, a, a battleground for geopolitics. Right. You know, there's, no, there's no profit in that. They're not stupid people. They understand exactly how the world works. Uh, less so the politicians in the domestic sphere, internal sphere of the U.S. Uh, government, not the federal, at the federal level, but below the federal level, uh, there's this whipping up of a kind of anti-Chinese hysteria about, uh, you know, potential bases in the Bahamas. That's not going to happen, the, not, not, not this, in the slightest way. And uh, there's no chance of any hegemonic designs being executed by China in the Bahamas. But every once in a while, some domestic politician in the U.S. comes up with this stuff, and you know we have to respond to it. But Mr. Uh, Mitchell, there are reports of <coughs> bases being, or former Soviet bases in Cuba being utilized, 
uh, now by Chinese soldier, soldiers. Uh, so you would say that you know it's just absolutely uh, unthinkable that let's say for example the Chinese would ask us to set set up some sort of uh, satellite outpost on let's say Kaisal or one no, of our I'm islands close to the Cuba. There's no strategic. First of all, there'd be no strategic. Uh, advantage for them to do that. Uh, but unthinkable, yeah, that's, that, that would be rubbish. Yeah. 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 We've seen where, you know, there have been, uh, I guess, uh, encroachments by the Chinese government and the, or the Chinese specifically in the, in the South China Sea and how that affects the uh, sovereignty of Taiwan. Taiwan has been traditionally uh, a good partner, I believe, of ours. Um, I think after, I think it was Hurricane Andrew, uh, that they would have given us much needed assistance in rebuilding. Uh, but now we're, pull, or now we face uh, this issue where China uh, absolutely dismisses the idea of sovereignty for Taiwan. Do you think that we will be forced uh, in the near future? There are reports that I think by 2035 or, or before that, I think by 2030 or so, uh, the China plans on making uh, some sort of Ukraine-like move in, in Taiwan. Do you think we will be forced uh, to take a side on that issue as well? Well, we've already taken a side. Uh, okay. Our agreement with them, when we got diplomatic relations in 1997, is there's one China. There's not two Chinas, only one China. And Taiwan's part of China. So that's their internal politics. And I, I don't think that's a dog we need to, that's, that's, that's not something we need to get engaged in. And uh, we've restated the principle of one China uh, time and again, right. and that remains the policy. Right. So that assessment or that, that policy position would differ from the United States' policy well, position? Well, the United States has the same policy, but, um, you know, they've been doing things which the Chinese, as in the People's Republic, uh, reject as consistent with what they've agreed in the articles that cr of, of diplomatic relations. Uh, but you know, um, Arthur Hanna, bless his heart, said when the South Korean ambassador showed up here, and I, and I actually met the man uh, last year when I was in, uh, in Seoul, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, South Korea and the Bahamas have something in common. We're both nestled next to giants and we're only as independent as the giants allow. And mm -hmm. that's precisely right. I mean, you know, uh, we are an independent country, but, you know, search and rescue is controlled by the U.S. Air traffic control, to a certain extent, is controlled by the U.S. So there are certain practicalities. The economy, you know, you know that uh, <clears throat> during 9-11, um, the place was shut down for two weeks. We started running out of food. You get food from the U.S. So as a practical matter, uh, you have to think about these things, and of course our voters, if they figure that we're going to lose pre-clearance, that government is gone if they're responsible for it. So there are all, all, all those sorts of issues that we have to face. But even with that, there's space sufficient for the Bahamas to plot its course around the world. And I think we've been successful in doing so for 50 years, and certainly this Prime Minister is quite adept at it. And the number one issue, as you know, is climate change. Right. It's existential for the country. Uh, I've talked about looking at that slide from the Explorers Club when I was in the Explorers Club in New York in right. September 2070. 30% uh, of New Providence will be underwater. By 2100, 70% will be underwater. That's a shocking statistic. Uh, we have to figure out how we adapt and mitigate what's going to happen to the populations of the country if that is in fact what ensues. So we got a lot of work to do. Right, and it, it's, it's actually, it makes me proud as a Bahamian, being from such a small country that we have such a uh, large voice uh, globally in terms of the message that the Prime Minister has carried to uh, COP26, COP27, uh, now COP28, about the existential issue that not only we face, but also uh, other coastal communities regionally and definitely worldwide. Uh, but in terms of the message and how it is being, um, how it is being addressed by world leaders, how they are receiving that message uh, that Prime Minister Davis is, is carrying around the world, do you think that there is, uh, I guess, a good reception to the message? I think that we still see that far too many 
uh, countries around the world that are producing far more carbon than us uh, are not doing anything about the issue, nothing uh, substantial? Well, I think it's like apple pie in the States. You, right. you, can't do, you can't say that you're against it. I mean, it just tastes so good. Right. So um, all the countries talk the talk. It's more difficult to walk the walk. Um, and that's what's happening now. So war in Ukraine has made oil more expensive, and people have to find alternatives. So the coal engines are being fired up. The British are allowing drilling to take place in the North Sea again. Right. Um, United States is rolling back some of the things. So, uh, you know, and, and we're, we're getting near 2030, and, uh, you know, I was just, Urko just did a survey, I think it was published in the press a couple of days ago, and they said that uh, they're talking about Bahamians and they're not buying into renewables. None of them had, uh, you know, listed the possibility. He said 80% or so had responded that they had not even thought about the idea of converting to renewables, and it seemed largely cost-related. So um, we have a lot of work to do with our own population to get them to buy into the fact that there is a problem coming down the road. Now, last I checked my life expectancy, I won't be here in 2050, so it's not an issue for me, it's an issue for you. In your lifetime, 2070, you'll still be alive. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is something which you and your generation have to adopt and figure out how we're going to deal with it. Well, I read uh, not too long ago that the first person to live to be 120 years old has already been born. So perhaps it could be you, and by then we still might need your foreign uh, affairs expertise. I actually uh, was sitting with you know, Ambassador Wendell Jones, Ambassador uh, Alfred Gray and uh, Ambassador Chet Nimoy, the troika of North American diplomacy for the Bahamas, uh, you know, and they all spoke uh, so well about your, your, I guess, uh, your conduct, the manner of your bearing, so to speak, uh, as, you know, our foreign minister, and the fact that everywhere they go around the world, there are people that will, you know, know you by name. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's a consequence of being around. But I mean, very kind of you to suggest that I might live to be 120. But I doubt it. And uh, what I'm saying is that I'm just making the more general point is that it's your generation that have, has to really buy into this uh, because you'll be consuming the resources. The place, I think the country is a wonderful place, uh, both physically and the way it's organized its economy which provides a good living and can provide a good living for generations to come. We are trying to make the decisions now which will protect that economy and protect our way of life. Um, when I left university in 1974, my American friends had asked me, why are you going back to the Bahamas? And I never thought for 30 seconds to live in the States. Not a place I want to be. This is the place I want to be. Now, how do we protect it? Well, adaptation mitigation is important. That costs money. How are we going to get the money? Well, you've got to go around the world and see if you can persuade people to lend it to you at concessionary rates or to give it to you as a grant because of moral suasion. And uh, your generation, again, is going to be largely responsible for carrying out any policies post-2030, which is when we're supposed to try and keep things below the 1.5 uh, degrees centigrade. Um, and what, what I try to tell people is with climate change is this is not something which is dramatic like the parting of the Red Sea in the Bible. It isn't that way. What yeah. is happening is it's slowly, slowly coming. So we got a briefing in cabinet a couple of weeks ago from the Ministry of Works about roads and what they have to do in New Providence over the next year, two years to fix the roads, which are admittedly not in the best shape. Yeah. And um, what I said to them afterwards is that the things about, about which our colleagues are complaining are really climate change issues because what's happening is the sea is percolating up through the ground and destabilizing the asphalt at the top. So you're having to repair, 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 repair. You're having to dig wells. Um, you're having to build sea walls uh, to try and protect the encroachment. Right. So all of these are things which you will you will have to be fighting for. Right.
And lastly, Mr. Mitchell, we've almost come to the end of our program, but you mentioned uh, recently, or uh, you hinted toward possibly uh, ending your political career soon, or that you were coming to uh, the twilight of your political career. Uh, do you think, uh, why is that? Well, I, I, I didn't quite say this. You know, you never say never. But I right. think, again, it's part of what, what I was saying earlier in the program, is that you have to objectify where you are. Right. Um, and there's a different generation around. Uh, there comes a point where you don't understand them, they don't understand you, you're not relevant to the times. You can be relevant to the times, and so you always reserve that possibility. You don't want to wear out your welcome. You prefer to go out um, on top as opposed to go out on bottom. Uh, and uh, so what I simply said, it's not likely that I'd be running for uh, office in the PLP again. I think that's the last campaign, that chairmanship campaign. Mm -hmm. I would like to run again in Foxo in 2026, and I think that's possibly the last, uh, uh, last campaign. Mm -hmm. But again, um, it all depends on what the circumstances are, but more likely than not. And I had a good friend, uh, Sir Albert Miller, who's now passed away. Right. And because I don't, fundamentally, I don't believe in retirement. I think you ought to work as long as you're physically able to do um, and yeah. find something useful to do. Um, and there's lots to do. But he said to me that um, everything was fine with him um, till he reached the age of 85. And once he turned 85, he said he found a dramatic drop in his energy level, which caused him then to say to, a, to his uh, kids, you know, I, I need to transition out. And, you know, my asked his son to come home and take over the company uh, at the time. And I think, again, that uh, people ought to understand where they are and when it's time to, to move. And that's all I was signaling. Um, I have a long uh, set of trips, which is why I call it the long goodbye, around the country, because I promised people during the campaign for chairman that I would, again, be revisiting where they are to hear what is happening with them and trying to set the party on a course for us to win in 2026. That is crucial, that is key for me as chair to leave that legacy of Mr. Davis and our colleagues being able to win again in 2026. Uh, to the extent that uh, my colleagues think that I'm relevant to that, um, I welcome it because as I said, I find it a, a great job. Um, it's been challenging. Um, I could argue a little bit about the pay, uh, but uh, since it's zero, <laughs> but uh, but again, um, on the money issue, uh, there are things which are more valuable than money, uh, which is the psychic satisfaction which you get from doing a service that you enjoy and seeing your values imprinted upon the country, mm -hmm. and that's what's important to me: is to create and continue a liberal democratic society with the values that I grew up with that uh, include tolerance uh, and an abiding belief and faith in the people of the Bahamas. Right. Well, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you for appearing on our program. And once again, congratulations to you on, on this recent victory. Great, great. And always nice talking to you. Thank you. And to you, our listening audience, our viewing audience, thank you for tuning in to our program, Jones & Company. Have a good night. <laughs>